The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there, I'm Mark Sebastian, the founder of OptionPit.com, and this is our Option Pit webinar of the month. I want to remind you this is for educational purposes only. None of this should be considered investment advice. Options have risk. If you have questions, consult a financial professional. Um, I would like to welcome Keith Harwood. Keith and I were traders on the floor for uh, both about, you know, about 10 years, and we stood next to each other for a couple. He's a good friend. Uh, I worked with him and actually kind of helped train him a little bit at Group 1, and he uh, ended up being a great trader despite that. Uh, he's a great guy. Um, I do a lot of you know directional stuff, but Keith has a really interesting system for developing trades, and he works at Option Pit uh, along with running Trade Academy. Um, but he does he runs a uh, a letter called the Breakout Bulletin, and it's all about finding names that are going to pop, and he's very good at it. So rather than me do give you an A minus job. <laughs> Uh, I am uh, I am going to give you guys an A plus job from Keith. Um, he'll be around to answer questions. I'll be on at the end to take questions as well. But he's going to go through and talk about how to how to make directional trading easy and how to um, you know really take advantage of directional trading opportunities. I know what you guys have in store, uh, and it's really good. So, um, without any extra delay, here is Keith Harwood uh, of Trade Academy slash OptionPit.com. Yeah, slash OptionPit. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, so, as Mark mentioned, um, I'm Keith Harwood. Uh, Mark and I have, have been working together for a, while, a long time now. And, uh, yeah, we do... A, Nice, I guess, bit of work together here. I've got Trade Academy as well as partnering with Mark on Option Pit stuff um, for the Breakout Bulletin, as you mentioned. And uh, I, I like to talk through some of these ideas and everything with um, Mark's chat group as well. And, and hopefully we can uh, all learn a little bit today with how I approach some of these setups. Um, before I start, all services and content are provided for educational and information purposes only and are not intended as legal or financial. I know Mark already said his disclosures. Here's mine as well. Make sure you read the rest. Uh, basically, it's all for educational and, for, and information purposes. That's the key. Before I get into much more, I want to give myself a little further introduction. So I've spent the better part of 13 years trading options now. Um, started off on the floor as an equity options market maker. Um, Mark helped train me when I first started at Group 1. Went into the pit. Uh, a little bit later on when Mark switched to a new firm, he ended up at the same in the same pit as me, and so we stood maybe five feet apart, and um, it was a good environment, I guess, being in the pit, working on uh, trading volatility arbitrage. As I progressed through the subprime meltdown and trading volatility and market making then, uh, it started to become clear to me that as markets tightened, the edge of being a market maker was going to be less focused on the individual trader and more on those computers. So I started working towards either new products or a little bit new of a new skill set. So I traded European treasury options overnight for about a year before moving over and trading gold uh, and silver futures options during quantitative easing. So looking for some more exciting stuff going on. And gold and silver were very much at the forefront of everybody's mind there during quantitative easing, spiking. People were talking about it going to 25,000. Sounds like something we've probably all heard about with Bitcoin recently. Uh, as I mentioned, I was a floor trader market maker, moved off floor. After I finished with gold, I finished my MBA at the University of Chicago with honors, really focused on some more statistical analysis and things while I was doing that, and then work, went to work for a CTA, which is a commodities-based hedge fund traded precious metals for them, learned a lot more about how they formulated directional strategies, and I taught them how to pair those directional biases with the options markets, using when option volatility is high, low, skew differentials, and everything else. There's a lot to it when you have a bias, and that really drove my interest after that point because I realized that if I have a bias, if I have a directional bias, if I have a price target, I can use the options market for massive amounts of leverage, much more so than just trading volatility. Started working through strategies that paired technical analysis and option analysis, 
and figured out a few pretty good systems here. Um, I started Trade Academy last year as a result of this and uh, really wanted to help teach others how to find an edge in the markets. So I like having two edges. I use technical analysis and options analysis as my two edges. I think you have one edge, you're in pretty good shape. If you have two edges, you're in great shape. And I've been trying to help teach people since I've started, really. I mean, I was helping teach people back at Group One throughout my career, new traders, hedge fund managers, all the way up and down the, the list. And so that is what brings me here to you to talk about directional trading. And really what I look up at the beginning is effectively called a swing trade. I'll talk about today what a swing trade is, technical setups that I like to trade, price targets and how I set them, why I use options instead of just the equity position or the equity trade that is, seems a lot simpler, but may not have the same risk reward profile. Why volatility matters. I've seen a lot of people that sit there and say, I can always create the system that no matter what I do, this is the term and strike call that I buy or put that I buy when this move happens. It's not that simple. I'll talk a little bit about why volatility matters. And then I've got a bun bunch of trade examples that are setting up today that um, I think you guys might be interested in seeing it in practice, I think usually helps uh, reinforce the, the concepts that I'm looking for here. So that's the exciting part, because that these are trades that are setting up today. Oh, what's a swing trade? Uh, the Investopedia definition is pretty good here. Um, swing trading attempts to capture gains in a stock within an overnight hold up to several weeks. Several traders use technical analysis to look for stocks in short-term price momentum, and these traders may utilize fundamental or intrinsic value of stocks in addition to analyzing the price trends and patterns. Let me simplify it a little bit for you. Um, I think of the market as really having three types of traders. Number one, the day trader. This is the guy that goes home flat every night. He is looking for scalp, small moves. He's using, in general, technical analysis and predictive analysis. A lot of this has moved over to the computers because the computers are better and faster and more efficient than individuals in most cases. That said, there are a number of people that I know that have made a career out of day trading and they do quite well. High frequency traders are a, well, a basically a subsector of those day traders down to those seconds and multi minute, middle, excuse me, millisecond long trades. But generally speaking, these are people using a lot of mean reversion tactics or short term breakout uh, tactics for their trades. The other extreme would be the investor, the guy that's looking for a fundamental story to play out over the course of months, if not years. Um, you know, you think about what people believe in terms of the future of technology. They might, you might start seeing people bet on Tesla being the most valuable country, or excuse me, most valuable company in the world. That's not there yet. It's not making money yet. And that doesn't hold the stock price down at zero because there's this expectation that if and when this thing figures out how to make money, it's going to make a lot of it. That's really where those investors come in and they are betting on major paradigm shifts in various equities. I like the swing trade for a very simple reason. These are short-term trades. I don't get married to the trade. I am dating stocks. These are not one night flings like the day trader. This is not marriage like the investor. I am coming in and I'm spending a couple of weeks or even sometimes just a couple of days, or and sometimes it's only a couple of hours because it moves so quickly, getting into a stock, getting out, and using that technical momentum signal to make my trade entry and exit. Technical momentum changes minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. The fundamental story changes less frequently, making it more difficult to make frequent trades. There are people that have obviously made a career out of finding those fundamental shifts. Warren Buffett found uh, his niche. My niche is in shorter terms. We're talking weeks, not months, not years, and not seconds, because I have to cross the market. So when I'm trading an option market, if I have to pay an offer and then I'm trying to get back out three seconds later and hit a bid to do so, I'm gonna lose money 99 times out of 100. But if I do it the right way, to make money. So with that in mind, let's talk about the technical setups that I like to trade. I focus on the breakouts. I don't focus on the mean reversion for um, a simple reason. 
the leverage is in the breakouts, not in the mean reversion, when volatility is as low as it is. With VIX this low, options get cheap. I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but let's first talk about some of the breakout type setups that I like. The first is a rectangle or a box. What you see is that the stock has been trading in a tight range, and eventually it gets out of that range. It's just that simple. So let's say we'll make up numbers for this. $100 on the top, 95 on the bottom. There are buyers in the market, generally maybe random walk. Every time we hit $100, there is a big seller there. He is not willing to sell, or he's not willing to let the market go. He is interested in selling out long shares from a lower level or establishing a short at $100. The market then re reacts saying that there is plenty of supply at $100 and starts to fall reaches $95. At $95, somebody out there says, I am willing to buy because I believe this stock is going to $150 per share. So there's a buyer that is fundamentally bullish at 95 or technically bullish or whatever at $95, willing to buy at 95, and there's a seller willing to sell $100. And so we keep chopping in this range. The people that trade in the middle of this range are part of that random walk behavior. It's There's bigger volume usually on the buyers here, bigger seller on the uh, the offers here. This is support, this is resistance. Eventually, we break out above resistance in a stock that was trending up before. If this makes a new all-time high, this stock loves going higher. As it goes higher, there are no people out there that are up money that are short the market. Let me repeat that. So the people that are short the market, people that are establishing shorts, they are thinking that this stock is overvalued. They're all losing money. And they're getting stopped out of their positions for risk control or for abandoning the reality that it didn't work. So they can have said that $100, this was fundamentally overvalued. This should have been an $80 company. But when it gets to $110, they're in so much pain, they just pitch the position and walk away. So they cover and they buy. The fundamental bull is still long. He is sitting back, hands behind his head, enjoying the fact that he just made this much money. And that creates this natural uptrend. There is a natural uptrend to the market because of daily investors, 401ks, money that is made in our economy flows into the markets and it gets invested. That helps create these natural short squeezes and natural uptrends when the, market, when the economy is doing well. As it is right now, you can see that in the uh, equity markets, the big indices, the S&Ps, the NASDAQ, IWM, all of them pressing towards all-time highs. IWM and NASDAQ already at all-time highs, s and is trying to get there. So we see that when that natural flow is up and we make a new all-time high, this can create this massive move. If this box is longer, i.e. days, weeks, months, that creates that much more momentum on the breakout because that many more people, more computers, more whatever, get comfortable with the concept that $100 is a selling point and $95 is a buying point. If this stock ranges between $95 and $100 for six years, you think anybody thinks that it's ever gonna go above 100 or below 95? No, but then when it finally does, everybody gets excited because they say, oh my God, it actually happened. So that is what creates this amazing momentum potential. The longer the consolidation period, the greater the potential explosion. It is a spring that is coiling. On the downtrend, very similar. It's just that you've got a stock that's been a falling knife. Finally, it stops and the long it sits there and says, oh, thank God, it's finally over. No more falling knife. And then lo and behold, it breaks again. So they get out, they give up. They say that I'm, why would I ever be long a stock that continues to go down when the market continues to go up? And the short says, why would I ever stop selling this stock? It's clear they're going bankrupt. Eventually, those names either go bankrupt or they do reach that consolidation point that finally turns it around. But in the meanwhile, when those breakdowns happen, it can get a little bit violent. When people give up, they are less price sensitive. That is the other thing to be aware of. People are price sensitive in this box about their entry and their exit. When we get out of it, the people that wanted to buy at 95 and missed are, have fear of missing out. They look to buy up above. The people that are selling at 100, they're looking to buy to just get out and cap their risk and be done with it. It's explosive. That's why I like it. The other thing I wanted to just remind on is re resistance and support. So the first graph I showed you showed 
basically that first support and resistance. And of course, new support and resistance is always being formed every time a breakout happens. When I trade a breakout that goes above resistance, that becomes the new support level until a higher support level is formed. So if we spike from here up, now we've created a new resistance level than the previous high, and we break down, we stop at the previous resistance, which is our new support, that's great. We go back up, down, everything looks great. And these breakouts continue to occur, up or down, at some point in time until eventually there's a failure here. And this seems to, that would be what happened in this chart. We had a great bullish trend, resistance was breached twice, and this time support didn't hold. So maybe this was just a little, oops, excuse me, just a little too aggressive to go up here. The rectangle pattern, uh, the question there, the rectangle patterns happen intraday too? Yeah, exactly. They do happen intraday. Um, but the big thing for these rectangle patterns that I like to focus on is the fact that the longer that um, the rectangle exists, so that longer period we're trading in that rectangle, the more explosive the move is. If you have a rectangle that's been going on, say, on a 30-minute chart for the last three hours, yeah, that creates some potential for an upswing but then you're looking at very short time horizons and smaller potential moves. So when I look at something that's been trading in the same box for two months, that creates that much more upside. Uh, there are, I, so I don't trade the strict retest like this. I'll show you the retest that I like to trade as opposed to doing something like this. Right? So this, Rick asked if uh, I, tra I trade the retest of the, the, the support here, no. The reason I don't normally trade the retest of the support in this style is that I don't get as much leverage. When I buy at the support, I'm looking for a move to that resistance. It's the move above that resistance that usually creates that explosive potential. I do have a pretty good feel if it retests support and starts to bounce that we're going to at least retest resistance, and that's where I trade this. It's a little bit more, uh, it's similar, but basic idea is. You could put that um, this bull flag as an alternative to that. Really what happens here is when you've got the bull flag, you've had a seller and either he is stepping down or somebody is basically trying to get ahead of that bull, uh, that, that seller, establish a short knowing that they've got to stop directly above. That's the resistance that I like to trade against, knowing that if I get the breakout above this sort of downtrend, I know I'm probably going to get a little bit of selling at this resistance, but that's the last point. If I'm in this box, if I buy here, we may chop around in here for months before breaking out. And if I'm buying options, I've got theta. So if I do something with a longer term view, longer term options, I can do that. A lot of stuff I focus on for these breakouts is very short term, gamma intense, higher theta options that have potential to multiply as opposed to being something that goes up by 10 or 20% over time. I'm looking for something that go up 400% in a week. Um, in these cases, the general feel is that there is an aggressive seller and a less aggressive buyer. And then all of a sudden somebody comes in and becomes a more aggressive buyer. That tells us that, that tells me that this little pullback was just profit taking. They're getting aggressive trying to take their profits. And then all of a sudden it goes again. Really nice when you get a big up move and you start to see that little flag and it retraces a little bit before going. That's, that's a great sign. I'm a little worried about that resistance level up here, the previous high. But if that's close, if this is just a, a very light slope, that's no problem at all. And if this is a steep slope, I'm actually getting in at a pretty good discount to that level. I just have to add a little bit more time to expiration on my options if I'm playing for a move above this level, because I may get a stall there. The pennant is actually, to me, the best when it happens. And the reason I like the pennant or wedge or whatever you want to call it is that this is what really creates the coil from the options marketplace. So in the box, you can see that realized volatility is about the same. So yes, there are people that are willing to sell options above this strike and below this strike, but they're not overly panicked and they may just kind of pass. And somebody that's long straddle is able to scalp some gamma. If you're a volatility market maker, you can scalp by buying near the lows, selling near the highs, even if you're long options, you're okay just reestablishing your delta. This guy can't make money buying and selling uh, delta against his position. So what I would see is a big up move, found a seller, came back down, found a buyer. 
the seller got more aggressive. The buyer gets more aggressive too. The seller gets more aggressive. The buyer gets more aggressive. The seller gets more aggressive. The buyer gets more aggressive. And eventually one of them wins. What I mean by one of them wins is, let's say that seller has 100,000 shares to sell and the buyer has 250,000 shares to buy. It's an extreme uh, difference in the weighting, but this guy that has to buy 250,000 shares is getting more aggressive because he's not finding a seller. At these levels, he's finding sellers a little bit above. So he's working to buy, he's trying to get his fill. All of a sudden that guy that had 100,000 shares to sell has brought his offers down enough to get himself completely filled and then bam, liquidity gone, skyrocket. On top of that, while we're coiling, realized volatility is dropping. So people that look at volatility on a realized volatility metric will say, implied volatility is at lows at this point, but it makes sense because the market, the stock is not moving. Okay. Well, the stock's not moving because you've got a price that is trying to clear. And when that price clears, the stock moves. Uh, the SPX did have a pennant that it sort of broke out of. I'll actually show a little bit of a chart of SPX, and I'm actually going to show you another one uh, that I really like is a little bit more of a longer term pennant as well when I get to the examples, uh, Trevor. So when we see these coils happen, usually what I end up finding is that people, as they're seeing this happen, this tightening happen, you get capitulation in the volatility landscape as well. That's why implied volatility is low. Everybody is just selling gamma because they're collecting theta. Well, may not be collecting that much theta, but when you're not getting any movement, who cares? Still collecting theta. And then when the breakout happens, they got to buy a lot of delta to cover their short calls. Or if we get down, they got to buy or sell a lot of delta to cover their short puts. So I talked about most of this on the uptrend. The downtrend is just the counter of it right now because the market's in an uptrend. I'm sure that most people are more excited about these. Um, but I will tell you, I do have a potential bearish setup that I'll talk about at the end as well. Um, so here is my, my favorite, though. It's that coil. I love the coil. Because of that, low implied volatility and inventory in the options markets is getting to the short side. So people are short gamma in general because they're just tired of not making money scalping stock. They're buying and selling in such a tight range that it's just not any fun. And after you know every uptick, they're never getting to the previous highs. They just can't, they capitulate, they give up and they sell the options. And then that's when that explosive potential really shows up. So I talked about how we can create these sort of asymmetric payoffs. In this breakout, sometimes they fail, like we saw here. You know, there, it was kind of a fail breakout. The upside tends to be fast and great. And to the downside, we know where the support level is. So oftentimes there's a bigger potential magnitude to the upside when a breakout happens, bigger potential magnitude move to the downside when the breakdown happens. That creates that extra tail risk. Tail risk is beautifully priced out with options because options traditionally assume a normal distribution, very minimal tail risk. One standard deviation moves happen roughly 65% of the time. So um, what that means is that, uh, sorry, that two thirds of every day, the stock will trade within one standard deviation of its previous closing price. That's the expectation. Two standard deviation moves happen roughly once a month. So every day but one in a month, the stock will trade within two standard deviations of its previous closing price. A lot of times when you get these breakouts, you can have two, three, five, six standard deviation moves. They're statistically not supposed to be possible. But because stocks don't actually follow a true normal distribution, they are possible. And because these quote unquote impossible scenarios happen, you get a lot of leverage out of the options. Um, Trevor asked, what is the HV doing during consolidation? During consolidation, HV is traditionally falling. So it gives a false sense of security to the short gamma. Uh, that is one of the keys here, because a lot of times people just look at HV and saying, well, HV is low. Why would I want to be long gamma? Well, I don't care if volatility is low in the past, if I think it's about to get high in the future. Let's talk a little bit about the stop losses, uh, the price targets that I set, um, because it's crucial to have a bit of a starting point.
when getting in. So be able to really identify the leverage of what the options market is providing. If, if you can't get a sense of where the market, the stock might move, then it becomes that much more difficult to generate a risk reward profile for an options trade. Uh, John, is there a probability distribution for options that you like better than the normal distribution? No, I honestly just use the normal, like I assume the normal distribution, but know that sales are bad. So I just, like I'm not gonna sit there and try to reinvent the wheel and create my own probability distribution um, pricing model. SKU is supposed to sort of help fix some of that. It's, I mean, I guess it's a, the market has a bit of a, what is it, right skew where the greater probability is slightly higher, but the tail risk is usually the downside. What I love about a breakout is that the market tends to put calls cheaper than puts. And so if all of a sudden the tail risk is to the upside and those are the cheapest options on the position, then that makes it that much more explosive. Um, that skew is a natural way for the options market to try to fix the fact that it's not a normal distribution and that it's a little bit more of a skewed distribution. Um, but again, it still doesn't quite fix the tails. You know, you'll see options that stay penny or two cent bid forever just because of it, the fact that it's not worth selling them for a penny. That it really doesn't have anything to do with the tail risk. It's just more that people aren't willing to sell options for a penny after commissions and fees. There's just not a lot of money to be made in doing that. Um, some people do it anyway, but that's not <laughs> that's definitely not my game. <laughs> um, so the first uh, of the price targets, I always start with the risk side because the risk is the most important way to keep yourself solvent in the game. If I don't manage risk, I can get blown out quickly. So even if my thesis is right and over time my system works, if I am mismanaging risk and oversizing positions, I can get blown out before my trade system pays me. So when I look at a stop loss, it's based upon support levels. If I'm long, resistance, if I'm short, if a support area is breached, it means that the bullish thesis is nullified. Just throw it on right here. If I have this breakout right here, we broke out through resistance. Initially, initially, my stop loss is this support level down here. Once I have seen enough of a move above here, I'll use basically a trailing stop philosophy and start trying to pull my stop loss up to support. And then I just watch the technical setups. If it starts to just look like a flag, even though it's drifting down here, instead of uh, this being actual support, it's creating a flag setup. That's okay. I can use that, but it's a very, it's an art, not a science. When we get into that point, that said, if I'm using options and I'm using out of the money options, I'm using a lot of leverage. I have to be willing to risk everything <laughs> that I put out if it's a short term option. If I look at this initially, this initial support has to hold no matter what. So if I was in a stock position, I could not possibly justify being long here and still long down here. It just doesn't make any sense for the way I would want to trade this because this has been the support. So if this is a false breakout and then we get a breakdown, there's a chance that this goes way down rather than breaking out to the upside. Um, perfect example of that is actually SPY. Actually, I actually have that chart up right here. There was a box right here. Not too long, but a few weeks. You can see the low was basically 270 and the high was around 274. Well, May 29th, so about a week ago, we tried to break down. And the next day we went through and then it chopped and then it broke out to the upside instead. So this turned from a bearish setup to a false breakdown into a breakout. And now we're testing some of this other stuff. I'll come back to the examples of, of some of the, the charts there in a minute. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about my price targets when I'm setting up these trades. If I am um, in a flag or a pennant, I look for that recent high if I'm going long as a potential resistance level. So that would be in this setup, this point right here at the top, that's a potential price target immediately, and this is a potential price target immediately. That is a short-term price target, but I generally expect these to eventually go through that level and continue higher. Because this coil is supposed to be telling me that this seller is stepping down, or the people that are selling in front of him are using him as a stop and that the buyer outweighed the sellers and he still has more buying to do. So then they should, if, if it's not this seller getting more aggressive and it was somebody else selling in front, they're gonna have to use that stop and the buyer still has more buying to do. So the general feel is that we should go through it, but there may be an initial point where 
some people that got long say, well, let's, let's maybe take a little bit of profits in case this just gets to here and then fails or to here and then fails. So you get a little bit of a natural profit taking at previous highs before making that new all time high. Um, that helps with the nuance of options though. It means that if I'm coming out of a pennant, I don't necessarily need one day options or two day options that are betting on a new all time high. I may need three, four or five weeks to get the new all time high. And I may be able to even sell an option with two or four or six days to expiration against it above that previous high as a way to reduce the total cost of my trade. Um, Am I trading option positions using conditional orders based on underlying support and resistance levels? Effectively, yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm using, I'm putting in option positions when I see the breakout stuff occur. Um, so effectively, yeah, it's basically a conditional entry for me um, based upon the technical and then also the option analysis. Um, and then John, do I use spreads sometimes to manage risks or mostly stop losses? So I usually use the stop loss rather than the spread that can be better and also worse. The reason is that if I try to create a spread, so let's say for example, I buy a bunch of calls and then just against it, I buy a put spread. That's great, but I'm usually then putting money on something that is, the, the put spread is a lower leverage trade than a call, than the outright uh, put. And it's betting on something that I think has a lower probability of paying out. So I'm pay my hedge has less leverage and my expectations that has lower probability. My preferred method of managing risk is to reduce my size. There are times where the alternative makes sense. And frankly, I think that there are really good nuanced ways to do put calendars and put diagonals and put butterflies targeting moves back to support and everything else. Um, but the, the real money is on the breakout occurring and then just managing the, the risk, or at least that's my feel for it. It, it. Everybody trades a little differently, right? And so those, I, I know a lot of people that trade a hedge against that kind of breakout as a way to say, well, at least I made a little bit of money on the hedge to reduce my loss. I just tend to try to keep it simpler and shrink the size of my position um to match just my total risk tolerance uh when i do a rectangle my target move is initially based on standard deviations which is expected daily movement so if i have 25 trading days to expiration then that means that i would expect the square root of 25 is five so five daily standard deviation moves that's how we do the calculation if there are 25 days to expiration that would be five times a daily standard deviation, 16 days uh, to expiration would be the square root of 16, which is four times a daily standard deviation move. Four days to expiration, I'd be looking for two daily standard deviations. So if I'm initially looking at something that, uh, you know, say it's a $100 stock and the one standard deviation move over a month is $10, my target is a $10 move. If I get two standard deviations, two st daily standard deviations in a single day. That's a good starting point where I need to reevaluate if I want to start taking money off the table. And the reason that I do that with the two standard deviation move is that tells me that I'll, usually when we get a two standard devi deviation move, a lot of the positions have been moving around. The shorts have been buying a lot and they're squeezing. Maybe they're capitulating. Maybe longs are piling in a little too much. And I've gotten a move that should take a week. And I've gotten a move. It should only happen once a month, assuming the normal distribution. Maybe it's a little more frequent than that. So I start looking at it on that. If there's not, that doesn't mean I'm exiting. It just means I'm really carefully evaluating the charts and looking for short-term momentum signals and things as a way to tell me if it's time. So I talked a bit about that support and resistance stuff, and I'm just going to keep going here and talk about why I use options. So I talked about that $100 stock. What if my price target because of a standard deviation move, a traditional standard deviation move is up to $120 on a breakout? And I know support is 90. So I'm gonna stop out of my position at 90 bucks. I can buy 100 shares of this stock, paying $100, cost me $10,000. And if the stock goes below 90, I lose a grand. And if it goes all the way to my price target of 120, I make two grand. That's not too bad. 
it goes to 96, I lose 400 bucks. But I've got a generally good R and R here. I'm making two grand if I'm right, and I'm losing a grand if I'm wrong, with a linear uh, function, I guess, in between. You know, I move to 110, I make a thousand dollars. But if the hundred dollar calls that expire in a month are five dollars, I get a lot more leverage for the big move. So you can see that on a move to 110, those two calls are each worth ten dollars. So my profit is a thousand dollars, the same profit as the stock. That's my break-even point, and above that, I'm making a good amount more money than the call than the uh, stock at expiration. If it happens faster, there's still some extrinsic value to these options and they could be worth more. Um, but if we get to 120 bucks, these are basically gonna be worth parity, $20. And if I've got two of them, that's $4,000. Minus my initial $1,000 cash outlay, I make three grand instead of two. That's pretty good, I make 50% more money with the trade-off being that anywhere between 90 and 110, I'm making less money than I would have on stock. That's what options do, right? They give us the leverage in a different scenario at a cost for a more normal payout, right? So if, if the market followed a normal distribution, we expect the stock probably to save between 90 and 110, and more likely I'd lose money on my options. But if I start thinking that there's a fat right tail here, there's greater upside, there's potential for this momentum to pay off and we hit some stops. Now I'm starting to think that maybe the move should be closer to 120. That creates that leverage, that creates that potential for the options to pay off much, much better than the stock. But on top of that, implied volatility matters and it matters a lot because Implied volatility is a mean reverting function. You'd, you'll see if you've seen some of the other classes that Mark's done um, or some other people, uh, you know, if you've done any analysis on, on volatility, it tends to mean revert. It tends to go back to levels that it's been in the past. Um, you know, the VIX has been drifting lower, but it's had a little bit of a spike here the last couple months. Uh, long term, the mean on the VIX is I think around 16. And so, while there may be periods where it continues to fall, when these moves happen, the volatility can actually increase back towards the norm, especially if you get a breakdown. If you get a breakdown, volatility tends to go above the mean. On a breakout, it may stay or stay near the low. If I've got a stock that's already trading at the lowest volatility it's traded at in a year, I feel pretty confident that my Vega risk is low being long options. If I think that it'll revert to 36% realized volatility going forward, or 30% 36% implied volatility going forward, either way, if I think the future volatility is 36%, or the volatility of these options will increase back to 36%, I have an edge. And the edge is pretty easy to calculate on these out of the money versus in the money options. So a lot of people like to use in the money options as a way to define their risk when they go into a swing trade or a technical trade. And the reason that people do it systematically within the money options is because you're giving up less edge when you don't know if volatility is high or low. So if volatility is high, these calls are mo still mostly intrinsic value. There's $6 of intrinsic value. There's $3.19 of extrinsic value. So a lot of more than 50%, you know, what do you call it, 60-ish percent of the uh, this option's value, 65% of this option's value, is still the intrinsic value. So the premium that I'm paying in excess of fair value is less. When the market, when the stock is, or sorry, when the option is out of the money, it's all extrinsic value, it's all volatility value. And if I can get a 106 call cheaper for the same amount of dollars of risk, I'm actually getting a much bigger discount. Because I don't get a discount on the stock price when I'm entering these, I'm getting a discount on the volatility when I'm entering these. Because remember, if I'm trading a breakout, I'm paying the offer on the highs, I'm not getting a discount, I'm not getting to buy a dip. If I wanted to buy a dip and get a discount on the stock during that, then this, this won't work. You know, I, I gotta get my volatility edge to pair with a price point that I think has explosive potential. I'm getting my discount in the options if I'm buying them cheap. And I'm actually getting a really nice setup if I think the options are overpriced to put on a different type of spread. Whether it's a call spread, call diagonal, call butterfly, all of these things have their place in directional trading depending upon the volatility regime and the type of technical move I'm getting.
particularly when it's not that clean breakout. The clean breakout, I'm generally really excited if I can get low volatility on that. That's the whole, you know, that, that's the whole basis of the breakout bulletin is finding cheap volatility when there is no resistance. But if I'm setting some of these flags, or it's a box in the middle of its normal trading range, and I've got a price target above for a normal resistance level that should come into play, that really creates really good opportunities and spreads. That'll be more for the um, masterclass that I'll be talking to you guys a little bit more about a little bit later as well. So one of the things I just wanted to illustrate here, a little bit more of an illustration about why that volatility matters. When we get a 30% implied volatility regime, you can see where my break evens kick in on the options. So the 100 shares of stock is fine relative to those 94 calls. It's kind of one or the other is fine. 94 calls can be a little bit better than the, the stock, can be a little bit worse than the downside. They're effectively the same. You can see the slope of the 100 calls is better. If I'm putting $1,000 into the 106 calls, I'm buying five of them. So I've got this massive leverage if I get that big move to 120. That's where I get paid out. <clears throat> if I can find something where there's a big tail risk and then the tail risk happens, I'm making six grand instead of one grand or two grand. I'm making three times the amount of money, same amount of risk. And the bad thing is if the stock stops at 106, I lose all my money if I'm in the 106 calls because those go out worthless. If I do this with vol at 42%, you can see how much lesser the potential is from the options. If I'm buying high priced volatility with out of the money options, I really need a move to 120 just to make this better than stock. Stock is better than the 94 calls no matter what because the 94 calls are so darned expensive. They're close to $10 um, per call. The 100 calls, it takes a long time for them to break out and be better than stock. Really above 115 is where options start to make more sense. Here, options make more sense really starting at about 110. <clears throat> that's why volatility matters. A $10 move, 10%, if that's all I need to get my break even versus if I need 15% to get my break even, that is a significant difference. And with that in mind, I wanna go through some trade examples. And there's a number of them I've got listed here. I am gonna to try to get through all. Um, we'll see if we have time. First thing that I wanted to talk about, because somebody asked about uh, the S&P looking like it's independent. Um, you know, if I can draw on here, that was the pennant that a lot of people really focused on, originally that one. Then they started saying, oh, if I connect the dots on the top there, either way, you know, like this was an interesting little graph. There's a little bit of art, again, to draw in the lines, but generally speaking, it looks like we've kind of gotten out of that, that uh, the, the one that goes back to here. So that's, that's kind of dead. Now what we're watching here, oh, lost my drawing tool. Sorry about that, here we go. Now what I think a lot of people are watching is this, you know, sort of uptrend here. And then of course, eh. Everybody's watching that level, 280. We got close to it in February on the recovery. We touched 280 in the March recovery. I'm not sure if we're gonna get through it or not, but that's gonna be a big level. Um, for those of you that like some of the subsectors, I'll just show you right here. IWM is making new all-time highs. That's Russell 2000. That's obviously much more bullish already. And the Qs. They are making new all-time highs above the March highs as well. So we're seeing some of these all-time highs kicking in. That's creating a lot more setups on the breakout side. We've seen some incredible moves. I wanted to show you an example of exactly what I'm looking at when I see a box. That's VRX. This one was an untouchable one, really. I mean, you could have gotten in maybe right here. Felt a little bit of pain, and then you had the gap. But really, this one was actually tradable. You could have used any either, either this 2245 level. I just went clean instead of above 2259, this was getting ready for a breakout. And there was some fundamental news that came out yesterday, it started to go and then it just went over the last 36 hours. It's because we had this box going in and people get excited when you clear those levels. Now, there was some you know trade up here around these levels that we actually took out, <coughs> excuse me, today. So we're now above all the highs of the last six months. People are really excited about this. I'm already out of this trade for the record, but you know, getting above 2259 was an incredible momentum building setup that caused a big move. Let's talk about one that I think is still setting up and it's partially done already. Apple. 
the prior high on May 10th was 190.37. A lot of people will tell you that if a stock gets above $190, it's going to 200. If a stock gets above 90, it's going to 100. The market likes round numbers. It likes to play round numbers. There may be some resistance at $200 in Apple as a result, but there's also a magnet to $200. People put big positions on betting for a change in the number. You know, when oil first crossed $100 years ago, that was a big point that everybody said, oh, it's going up above $100. And I think it ended up touching like 150. On the way back down, when it got back below 100, that was a big number. And then every $10 down, it started becoming a big number. And on the way back up, 10, every $10 becomes a big number. Everybody loves those big, even numbers, the new handle. In the VIX, it's every dollar when you're going down. 13 VIX matters, 12 VIX matters, 11 VIX. It's all these even numbers that people like to set their price limits at. So this initially broke out in Apple, um, really on, on Monday, and it's had some continuation. It's just trading and closing at the highs today. The other thing we've got here is implied volatility in Apple is at its lows for the last six months. It's 16%. So with implied volatility this low, and part of that's because realized volatility had been pretty low, but the breakout happening and a potential for a move to $200. I don't really feel like I have a lot of vague risk on the downside, but I do have a higher probability of a move of up six and a half ish dollars um, or six dollars to get to 200 bucks. That's about a 3% move. Should, in theory, take about two weeks to get there. Based upon a 1% average daily move, that means it would take three standard, three daily standard deviations, which would be nine trading days. So we can kind of back that out. And that's how I can use that to trade the options. So I could trade something that expires in about nine days. That would be the June 15th option. So I can give myself a little more time. And I like to give myself a little more time just in case we consolidate for a few days. But if I can go to these June 22nd, 197 and a half calls for a buck 42, if it takes three weeks to get, you know, three, three and a half weeks to get to 200 bucks, these basically double. If it happens faster, this can pay off a lot more. That's the whole point of this stuff. I'm looking for these. If you know, if Apple decided to go to $200 tomorrow, this could be worth, you know, four and a half bucks. I triple my money. If 200 isn't a st necessary stopping point, but it gives me an initial target. There are things I could do to try to cheapen the trade, but I think that just naturally going for the move to 200 with the 197 and a half calls and not capping myself in case the market just goes into runaway bull mode is always nice. So that's just an initial, easy kind of setup, an outright call on Apple. I'll give you another one. Autodesk has been trading in a little bit of a bouncy kind of range, right? So it's been between 138 down to 120. Uh, Noel, uh, I'll check out JD for you in a minute because I, I do like looking at JD since it's Chinese. Um, you know, ADSK has been going from 120 to 138. That's a pretty wide range, but you can see that this lower end has been slowly stepping up and the higher end is still sitting right around this 138 level. Really the breakout's gonna be above 140 here. So it's not quite there. But if it happens, I wanna look for a trade. And one of the previous, I mean, the previous high here is 141 and a quarter. One of the things that I noticed when I was looking at ADSK is that while volatility is very low here at 25%, 24.5%, go look at the options. The June is trading at a ball premium to the middle of the term structure here these following weeks. When we see volatility get this low, usually the market goes into contango. And that means the very front end is cheaper than the mid terms, the later terms. Um, it's harder to see sometimes in SPY because of so many expirations. So I'm going to actually switch this and go to IWM instead. But in IWM, you know, the June is a little bit of a bid there too, but basically it's kind of a flat term and you can really see as you, as you go out that these volatilities slowly rise. It's, it's the VIX futures, ter or futures structure. That's the easiest way for me to show you this. The futures curve in VIX. This is showing what that contango looks like. The front end volatility is cheaper than the three, four, five month options. So when I go back to these options in ADSK and I see that the front month is a little bit bit over at 26% and that realized volatility 
is 35% for the last 10 days, but generally it's been in the high 20s. I don't mind being short a little bit there on the out of the money option. So I could go out and I could sell the June 15th 144 calls for 45 cents to reduce the cost of my trade while going out and buying the June 29th, which you can see is a little cheaper, 142 calls. So I'm buying something that's got, you know, it's a 24 ball for call it a buck 75 and selling something that is a 26 ball for 45 cents. Even if the stock explodes, this is gonna be worth $2. So I'm gonna make money even if the stock tomorrow morning goes to $180. Of course, if that happens, I will wish I was only long a call, but I'm not going to allow myself to lose money while being right. And that's one of the keys on all of these things because when I'm trading an individual name, any of these could get taken over at any point. Maybe that's the reason that it's going higher. Maybe people are building a position. Um, let's take one of those ones, uh, one from the audience here and then I'll get back to my list, JD. So this has already had, you know, a pretty darn violent move last couple of days. And you can see part of it's from breaking out of this wedge. Ah, Jesus, got to get this, got to remember to click on that. You know, you kind of had this downtrend. Usually I try not to, uh, to always fully try to draw them you know, precisely. If I can't really see it with my eyes, then it's probably not there. But it's something like that, you know, you start seeing that move, you get above some, recent highs got above this recent high this high at 4130 you know there's a lot of levels that is just getting through and it's not slowing at these resistance levels people seem to be really bullish i have a tougher time with this because we've already gotten three big moves in a row a lot of times those three big moves in a row are a natural stopping point the market needs a chance to breathe it doesn't always happen you can get five six in a row but three big moves in a row like this I often think of it as a pretty good take a breather point for me. Um, the question of if I don't have a directional opinion on SPX is the double calendar the best spread to make money? Uh, depends upon the, the volatility setup. So remember if SPX is showing that massive contango, that if, if you're doing a double calendar, you are buying cheap ball, but you are also selling cheap herb ball. That's part of the reason I like these individual names is that a lot of times, instead of having the natural VIX contango, it's a flat line. So I'm buying cheap ball and selling slightly more expensive ball. That actually almost sets up better for that double calendar than the index products. The only risk being that if I'm trading into a breakout, then that gamma pickup really uh, is, I don't wanna be short that gamma, right? Um, let me look at Baidu and see if this is any, uh, if this is a little different from JD because I haven't looked at that today. So this one's a, um, a little different, but we had the one big move in. We're starting to slow. So today had an inside day. That means it was a lower high and a higher low. This may set up a small consolidation point, and then that would create that next potential light higher. You know, if, if I can get above that previous high right there of two hundred seventy dollars and fifty eight cents, that seems like a natural stopping point at two eighty four. So let's see if Baidu Vol is cheap enough to make a play here. And it's somewhat cheap at twenty nine percent, but it could certainly be cheaper. You can get down to 25% very easily. Part of the reason this volatility is so high is because the realized volatility has been so high. You see these big move, big run, big crash, big run again. A lot of movement going on in here right now. So this isn't necessarily something consolidating for a breakout. It's just flipping around kind of crazy. If I have a bullish bias on this, I think that generally speaking, this is a stock where I would be looking for a move back you know, if it gets through here up to 283. And in the process, I would not be surprised to see this volatility drop down to 26% or lower. So this is a spot where I might look at a butterfly and just go to June 29th and say a 270, 280, 290 call fly because this volatility is 30. And if the vol comes down 4% on a move to 280, where I'm getting short Vega, I have a really good r, &R. So I just end up buying one of the 270s, selling two of the 280s and buying one of the 290s. Price on that looks like it's about, what is this, 537 minus 258 twice. So that's uh, ugh, 517, so 20 cents. So it's about a buck 35. 
if we move to a buck 80, a 280 install, I mean, the max value on this is 10 bucks, but if it got to three or four, that would be a pretty darn good R&R &R for something that's not actually traditionally a massively leveraged trade. So that's, that's the kind of setup that I look for a butterfly actually, is when I see that a little bit more movement, but a spot where naturally volatility can come down. Going to my next one, um, here is a setup that I actually think is one of the more exciting ones because it's just coiling for so long. So over the last six months, you see Aflac hasn't really moved. Everybody was probably looking right now and saying like, Aflac, who cares? Well, remember, part of the reason that this becomes that much more exciting is when you get a move of this kind of magnitude. You know, this was on January 12th, the stock moves $4 and shops around. It's got these big moves in here. If I can get a $4 move to the upside when implied volatility in Aflac is 13%, that's telling me that this stock should move about three quarters of a percent a day. If I can get a seven or eight percent move off of a breakout, that is massive. So when this implied volatility here is 13, it's basically at the lows. Historical volatility is actually picking up a little bit. And we're testing the recent highs while slowly raising up the low. So you see that wedge formation with the high just being this recent high, it's basically 46 bucks plus or minus. There was a little bit of a test above, but at 45.88, it tried it out. This creates an incredibly explosive setup where the options are actually very, very cheap. I just have to wait for that level to cross because eventually, Either the stock's going to break out above 46 or, you know, get back down below 44 and start showing up a bearish signal here. But if it gets above 46, all that recent selling is out of the way. If it gets above 46, I can look at something like June 29th, 46 and a half calls to right now, 30 cents. So just think about how dollar cheap those are. If the stock has that potential for a two, three, four dollar move, if it goes to 50, these are worth three and a half bucks. That's the kind of leverage that I see in these outright options. This is one of those spots where I would set it up with an outright option for that reason. Uh, let me keep working through a couple more because you know there's just a lot out there and I wanna also make sure I get you guys a bearish setup. Um, MAR. So yeah, it ran today and it stopped right at the May 16th high. There's a couple of natural resistance points here above, and they're just recent highs. So we've seen this little recent high here at one, just about below 145, here just below 146, and then here, of course, just above 149. So we have these natural resistance points on the way up. I'm not sure which one, if any, is going to actually trigger. Maybe it doesn't have any resistance there because that's more important. Maybe it all goes all the way to 149. But again, when volatility is low, and I've got this potential for a price target around say 146 and implied volatility is as low as it gets in a year i don't have much vague risk and realized volatility is about in line with this implied volatility it's again i could just do one of these little diagonals buy some june 22nd use a little bit of the nuance of options get some of these 144s at 18 and a half ball and against it you can sell some of these 146s that seem cheap at 16 and a half fall, but I'm telling you right now, I'd probably be able to sell at least 17 and a half fall. And I'm only selling those not because of the vol level, but more because of that uh, natural resistance there somewhere between 144 and 146 that's coming from this high and this high. So we might blow through both of those levels, but today we already stalled at one of them. It seems to me like in the next week and a half, if we got to this level and this one level, we'd stall for at least a day at each. That makes 146 a pretty low probability play even though they seem a little bit cheap right now, into a rally, a breakout above the next level. Maybe these already are up at 30 cents and it's just a way for me to cheapen my trade. Um, if I know that the S&P can go max 80 points up or down or nowhere at all in the next seven days. So that is a complicated type of trade. That is more about volatility. What I would what I generally look at there is um, it's basically a, a sort of a double ratio where I'm short a straddle and long a ratioed number amount of strangles. Because the next seven days implied volatility in SPX, the market is saying, yeah, it's taking a little while to load here. 
Come on, I'll switch to SPY. Oh no, here we go. All right, so the seven day ad options, June 13th. You see what the market is trying to tell us based on Australia. It's saying it can go 26, it should go about $25. So I think there's a chance that we can go 80. Then if I buy, you know, if I sell one strangle here, the 2770 and the 2775, and collect $24 a premium, and then use that to buy three of the 2735 puts and three of the 2800 calls, all of a sudden I got this position that if the market moves 80 points, these are worth 50 a piece. Or if it goes 80 points to the downside, these are worth 45 a piece. So that helps offset the cost of the short strangle and actually turn or the short at the monies and actually turns it into a winner. It really, really sucks if this market moves 30 points. So it's a really complicated trade from that perspective. It's not an easy trade to make. I'll give you that for sure. Not an easy trade to make. Let me do um, two or three more setups here. Uh, and then I will show you guys something else. Because that's, uh, that's how I like to roll here. <laughs> um, first setup I want to do here is the bearish setup. Because everybody has to find a bearish setup in this market. You know, look at NTAS and say, why is this bearish? I just can't find a bid. You can see that it's basically just every time it gets bought up. You see this little repeat move here? It gets a little dead cat bounce when the market rallies. This market's rallying and it's not rallying either. So if tomorrow's a lower high and a lower low than today, it's starting to set up for that next curl lower. You may find a little bit of support here at the previous low. So if I want to trade for that support at the previous low, I do a put diagonal. If I just want to trade for it to break down, I just go with the outright put. Um, the outright put that I kind of like here because of the way the vol is set up here, because again, even though this is trading at lows, vol is at lows. That's kind of ridiculous because these are insurance contracts and people tend to panic and buy insurance when a stock is dropping. You're driving your car and you're about to hit a wall. You buy insurance at whatever price it costs. And this stock looks like it may be about to hit a wall of selling if it gets down below 223. And yeah, I know that's 14 bucks away. It could happen in less than a week. So where do I look here? I add a little bit of time because there's a little bit of a natural support below. I'll go out to June 29th, that gives me three and a half weeks. 230 puts are $3.40 and they are 29%. It's really cheap. 340 for this thing. If it just retests lows, these are worth seven and a half. If it blows through, you know, go to 215, those were 15 bucks. That's that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about here already is, okay, I want to play for the retest of the lows. That already pays me on a retest of the lows. If I want to cheapen my trade a little bit in case we stall at the lows, just look at these June 22nd, 220 puts. And say, okay, well, if we retest the lows and then stall, these go out worth nothing. If it takes time to get down to lows, if we grind lower, these helped offset my theta. And if I think that this support has no chance of holding because I think the market as a whole is going to turn over and this is going to help be one of the weakest performers in the case, then I just don't bother with a 220 put. But the reason I picked 220 is because it's below that strike. One last one I kind of want to show you guys um, just because I like this stock. I traded a few times and you can just see what it does sometimes when it gets that momentum and somebody gets excited. And, you know, maybe this is. This was all the value being extracted from the market already, the move from 40 to 53. But right now it's retesting the highs and creating a little bit of a wedge here. See, you got this uptrend here and this downtrend here. So, you know, basically if we get above, we'll call that Tuesday's high, it starts to show some really nice strong potential for a press of 60 and then a potential breakout after that. Again, because we've got that potential resistance at 60, I want to cheapen my option trade. Um, with that diagonal, and you know the ball doesn't really get above, below 42, and I've got options that these are only has has monthly options, no weeklies. But I can very easily buy a July 60 call for two bucks and sell the July 60 two and a half call for it won't be a quarter because I'm waiting for that move higher. We're talking about like 40 or 50 cents. If this 62 and a half call is still only a quarter, then it's not worth selling. But if I can get some premium for it above a natural resistance point, that makes sense to me. That's the whole point of this cheapening option. It's got to be expensive enough still to justify the sale. At 49 vol, the vol level is expensive enough, but the price level is not expensive enough. The 60s aren't a good sale for me because that's a natural, that may be 
you know, the, the resistance is actually slightly above 60. The previous high was $60 and oh no, it was actually dead on 60. For some reason, I thought it was a little bit higher. But in any case, I'm not sure I want to just go straight calendar anyway. Because then if the stock runs to 70, the calendar goes out to zero. So I can't, I don't like doing straight calendars. I like to do the diagonal and make sure that my trade makes money if the stock rallies through my initial price target. All right, I'm gonna skip WPM because it's honestly not as exciting and I'm running out of time. If you guys found a lot of this interesting the way that I find it interesting, um, check out the Breakout Bulletin. Uh, I collaborated with Mark on this. It's um, a newsletter that I do few times a week. I mean, right now I've been putting out videos almost every day because new ideas are coming up every day. And I just look through setups like I've talked about with you guys today. A lot of them are very leveraged. Um, you know, we get some big moves. I mean, I'll give you a recent mover just to give you guys some excitement because I closed this one yesterday and I closed this one today. Macy's yesterday and AMD today. So we get these, you know, sometimes I catch these really good moves as a result of the way that this starts. And, you know, AMD, I got in all the way down here. So some of these things can come up with some pretty amazing uh, moves. Uh, Klaus, my email is actually keith at tradeacademy.co. I'll put that, um, where should I put that here? Into the chat, I guess. There, that is. Um, so everybody can see my email there if you have questions for me. Um, again, so the breakout bulletin is $97 a month. It generates a bunch of actionable trade ideas. That's the whole goal, right? Or typically you're excited for, interested typically in stuff. for a year in what, like one trade, right? Yeah, so I'll give you a couple of like so I make money on about 45% of my trades, so it's a little lower than 50%. But when I make money, I triple my money, and when I lose money, I lose around 80% of the premium because I'm doing these very short dated options like I've talked about. So I'm basically, my winners are two and a half times the size of my losers. So that more than offsets the slightly lower batting average, we'll call it. Yeah, you, know, you can find a system that wins 60% of the time, loses 40% of the time, and net loses money. I do the opposite. I try to find a system that is close to 50% winners, but with multitudes higher win ratios. Or wins, wins. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, so Keith, can you drop in the, can you drop in the link so that people can get take care uh, take advantage of this ridiculous offer that you're making? Yeah. So the first one I'm going to put in is the breakout bolts, and if you just want that for some reason, but I think that if you're savvy and interested in the breakout bulletin, you go here and try this one out. The directional and, option and, trading and, made easy. And this and is the one you want. And this is the one you want because it's $197 for the course. It's four hour long webinars. I'll go through a lot more stuff than I did today. And you get a month of the breakout bulletin, which is $97 and mastering trading breakouts with options, which I, um, it's a, I think four hour masterclass. Yeah, it's a 297 it's bucks as well. It's normally 297 as well, yeah. So we're talking 700, 700, 700 yeah, for, so for $700 you can, so for 197 you get $700 worth of stuff. And truthfully, I think the breakout bulletin is worth a lot more than 97. I, I, it's a great newsletter. And, and the beauty is that, uh, you know, those setups turn into just a great option trades. And a lot of the winners then turn into trades that can turn into something else. It is a really great, great uh, newsletter. I, I, we've had the retention on it is really high because everybody makes so much money. Let me put it that way. It's a great yeah. course that uh, he's going to be starting to teach. The mastering trade out, uh, trading breakouts and uh, with options course that he did was a what four hour course that you did? I think it was and about you, four hours, and it talked and, a lot about technicals and oh, a lot of that other stuff in there. That uh, you know, it's just there's not enough time. To cover it in an hour obviously i mean this is you know this is my whatever years of of uh of learning trying to get compacted into as a tight package for everybody so that you guys don't have to go through the expensive cost of figuring out what works best yeah so for 197 bucks you can try the breakout bulletin for a month you get this great directional options trading made easy you get mastering trading breakouts with options 
um, worth at least 700 bucks, and it's $197. And I'll tell you, if you take the class and you don't like it, I'll give you your money back. And so there's no risk. But I'll tell you, you're not going to want your money back. So exactly. uh, <laughs> the next question is, well, what if I want to keep the breakout bulletin? How much is it going to cost me? The answer is, um, I'm going to let you take the breakout bulletin for $77 instead of $97 for six months so that you can pay for the next, you know, two, three years of the breakout bulletin. And um, you'll be really happy. So I would really encourage everybody to take it. Like I said, it's riskless. I'm going to pay you back if you don't like what you're taking. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a can't lose. So what I would say is, you know, be smart and take this class. You'll be very, very happy. Um, I we have any questions about the actual course? Sort of a couple quick questions here. Rocky, to answer your question about Live Ball. This is Live Ball Pro versus Live Ball X. Live Ball X is undergoing maintenance right now. So I'm on Live Ball Pro here. Um, it's got a little bit more analytics than LBX, but it doesn't have execution capabilities. Yeah. So there's you, you can't know, some, execute through Live Ball Pro. Um, exactly. So there's some good so, and bad but, about it. But we actually at Option Pit for our members, including Breakout Bulletin, have access to um, Live All Core, which actually has most of the analytics that you need, plus Trade Hawk, and yeah. all you can trade at a great price. So. Uh, like I said, if, if you're not taking advantage of this offer, I don't I don't know what's wrong with you, uh, but you're going to be missing out. Um, so, and then there was sort of a question here. Right? Even even my wife, who's into fashion, thinks that you need to be taking this offer. <laughs> hey, I mean, we we traded some fashion names recently. We did Lu, we had Lululemon during the uptrend. Uh, uh, Lululemon. Tailored brands, which is men's warehouse. I'm sure that your wife loves that place. <laughs> uh, TPR, Coors, you know, like a lot of the retail names have been going well. I mean, I had Macy's, um, still have L brands. Um, one of the ones, the question here was, uh, that was a class that I did a few months back, but all of the uh, concepts still apply. Um, the other question, actually, an example of what I can switch cars, I can just tell you um, two of the three basically trades I made today just because I think they're the two most important ones. AMD I exited. So the rationale behind this is at, um, at vol levels where they are, I was looking for a 5% move to exit. We got a 5.5% move today. And I was in the June, was it, June 29th, $15 calls. That was a nice trade. I, I, that was the third leg. I started with some 12s and I rolled those up to 14 and there's those to 15. So overall, you know, I, I've, I've gotten to ride this for a while, but I sold these out at a buck. Um, and part of the reason that I told people that I was doing that was because ball finally picked up. It's up about 41%. So I was looking at, you know, this with cheap ball at 36, 35% and it got up to 41% and even higher in these June 29th, you can see that those are, um, oops, we got to go back down to them. You know, those are 45 and a half percent. It's no longer cheap ball. The stock had made a two standard deviation move today, so it was time for me to exit. That was t that was giving me my signal. Uh, and then I put on a new trade today that I'll tell you guys what it was. Um, it's it's higher now. Uh, I got into the July 33 calls in fifth third. Fifth third is going to go straight yeah. up too. Um, so, I mean, the ball here is not as cheap as I've seen in other names, but the bank rotation thing looked like it was getting set up here. I liked so, the way that this fifth third looked like a squeeze potential to 33 and a half pretty quickly. I didn't really want to sell those June 34s because that's the only strike I would have been willing to sell. And obviously I'm not selling them for any premium, but I liked the July 33s because they gave me enough time to play this out. And they were 32 cents between 31 and 32 at the time. So they're already up a uh, eight cents. So those up 25% in the same day. So like I said, um, you know, just having followed Keith, you'll pay for the class with the trading that he's doing, and you get this extra awesome directional trading class for free, and like I said, a month of that breakout bulletin. So 
just, you know, if you don't take this offer, you will regret it because you will have missed a, a great chance to make a, a decent amount of dollars and to learn a ton from what I think is one of the more talented option traders in the country, in my opinion. And it has well, to do with the fact that, you know, he's my progeny. It has to mostly do with the fact that he is the, the master, the, the student has become the master is what I would say. The guy knows, the guy knows more about directional option trading than I'll ever forget. He's that good. So, Wait. Uh, go in there, take advantage of that uh, that offer. Any, there any other questions about um, uh, the the breakout bulletin or the two courses that we're you're gonna get? If not, we'll let a, let everybody go, and uh, we'll have ourselves a great night. Yeah, thanks everybody for um, attending and I hope you all learned something today and I hope you all take advantage of the directional options trading made easy uh, offer we've got here. All right. Looks like no. So everybody have a great night.